it's this weird like intellectual porn that people are just addicted to like focusing on things that have already been figured out hoping that maybe they'll you know they'll find some new new edge and sometimes people do so i don't want to shun this entire idea but developers i think are the most guilty of doing this the most guilty this is devops paradox episode number 182 why you should start a side project Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, how many side projects have you started in your career? Five, six, seven, something like that. I mean... When I say projects, I mean kind of real projects, meaning projects that are used by somebody who is not me, whomever that somebody is, right? Those projects were very unfortunate because the technology used by those projects kept dying on me. But what if you had a project that you wanted people to use? Hmm, how would we do that? Would you consider running a GitHub app today? GitHub app... As, yeah. a, as a project, as a hobby? To do a little thing. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah. We just so happen to have somebody that's done that. Sort of. We have Ryan Culp on from Merge Freeze. Ryan, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Merge Freeze is a GitHub app, right? Am I saying that? That's completely true. Yes, sir. In the marketplace, one of the maybe three to 500 apps in there right now. I think one of the fewer paid apps. Most are free, but... We've been on there a couple of years. And what's interesting is Ryan is chief developer, chief executive. I'm assuming you're not the CFO, but maybe you are. <laughs> well, I, um, I have a spreadsheet, if that's what you mean. You have a spreadsheet. Okay. And you cook your own coffee, right? My girlfriend makes my coffee. Ah, yeah. So you do delegate something. Okay. It's a collaborative effort. I heat up the Quest bar while she does the coffee. We'll get into the other side of... Ryan's story in a moment, but what does Merge Freeze do? Merge Freeze is for dev teams, mostly 50 devs and above, who want to basically protect their master branch, their main branch, from random bugs getting merged in, maybe by junior devs or devs that aren't paying attention. And so what Merge Freeze lets you do is schedule different freezes. Like you could say, hey, freeze our master branch every weekend. Uh, and it also lets you sort of just set up freezes so that your CI and your checks that might happen during a pull request pre-merge kind of get halted and you can add notes, you know, so a, a dev across the world might say, I need a freeze master because this thing is happening over in our other microservice. And that's a great way for them to asynchronously share that news with every other dev without raising alarms, doing at all, you know, blast on Slack and things like that. So I would say it's definitely got different use cases across our customer base. We've got open source users and paid users. They use it a little bit differently, but I would say primarily it's for remote teams to um, communicate asynchronously about issues they might be having on master where they still want people to write code, but they don't necessarily want you to merge it in. So basically it's the vacation out of office for your branch. Absolutely. Yes. Is there anything else to say about merge freeze? I think we got through it pretty quick. Wow, that was a great episode. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks for having me. It goes beyond that. How did you get to Merge Freeze? I'm actually not the founder. I'm just the guy running it now. And the founder started it a couple of years ago, guy based out in New Zealand. And I came across it because someone I sort of know through the internet was attempting to buy it from the founder. And uh, I guess something happened and it wasn't the right fit. And he emailed me because what I've been doing the last five, six years is buying small apps like Merge Freeze, growing them and hopefully selling them to someone else later. He said, hey, maybe you'd be interested in this. And I checked it out 
And to be honest, I wasn't interested either. And I sat on it a couple of days and I kept going to the website and thinking about dev tools, the whole space in general, and thinking about the GitHub marketplace, which is, I think, a pretty exciting avenue nowadays. And I thought, you know what, we can make something happen here. Long story short, 15 days later, Merge Freeze was ours, the seller, you know, money was in the bank, code was transferred over, and the pain began. <laughs> so that was, that was earlier this year in February. And so throughout 2022, spring and summer, just been, you know, banging out a bunch of features, listening to customer, you know, requests and feedback, playing around with, you know, the UI, all the fun stuff you'd want to do when you take over an app. And I basically have been treating it like a house flipping project. So you find a small house and you say, well, they, you know, we need to touch up the paint in the kitchen and maybe add a new appliance and make the yard have nice green grass. And that's what I try to do with small apps like Merge Freeze. And it's, it's been going well. It's been growing and I'm seeing a lot of promise and potential with the GitHub marketplace and I think DevTools in general as, as a new thing for me to be working on. Now, of course, you have your master's from large university X, right? <laughs> No, I, I did go to university for marketing. So that was my bachelor degree. Oh, wait, you don't have a CS degree? No. Yeah, I just, you know, I went to Thailand. I went to the University of uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand for a few months where I did nothing but learn to code online, if that's what you mean. Uh, people, if you're listening to this, if you don't get it yet, Ryan is not your classical computer science nerd. He was a marketer and he bought an app and he's selling, I guess, through subscription, right? Is that how it mm -hmm. works? Subscription on GitHub Marketplace. And this is just one of a handful of apps that he's doing this with, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Now you're sitting there as a developer saying, heck, I could do that. Ryan, can they do that? Yes, 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 yes. And that's what I wanted to communicate today, actually. Uh, so I, I thank you everyone so far for listening to my spiel on Merge Freeze, but I really don't want to pitch our, our project. I want to pitch an idea that sort of in the cliche sense, if I can do this, so can you. But I think particularly with this Merge Freeze example, I've actually avoided dev tools like the plague. I personally, of course, I use, you know, CI tools. I use Circle and whatever, the main couple things. I use Code Climate for linting and whatever. But otherwise, I don't know much about dev tools. You know, I don't always install like the paid plan of even like logging or like error monitoring. I'm a very like YOLO, you know, fake dev hacker. Um, and by the time projects I'm working on get more serious, you know, there's probably enough revenue for another dev who's better than me to come in. So I've always avoided dev tools, GitHub apps, Anything that other where developers are the customer, it's like, well, I don't want them to all realize that they are more aware of what's going on with the product than I am. So I've avoided it. But the last few months with Merge Freeze has really even opened my eyes to what's possible. You know, I think taking over a project and running it can sound or feel daunting, but it's really just like anything else. You just make iterative changes. We've all started new jobs and you get this huge monolithic code base. I don't really think most of us go line by line and try to learn it or memorize it. We don't make flashcards. You know, what does line 37 do in this service class file? Instead, you just sort of figure it out as you go. You know, now I need to extend this feature. Now I need to fix this bug. You, you go through logs and backtraces and figure it out. And I think that is analogous to filling in all those other gaps with running a small project. I've never done customer support. I don't usually talk to humans. Ah, uh, well, you'll figure it out. You know, how do you want to be spoken to? Start there. Uh, you know, I, I've never really done marketing or ads. How much should I pay? I don't know. Go on Indie Hackers and type in the word ads and see what people are paying and where they're paying it to. Um, I think you can kind of with the hacker mindset, figure out all the, the soft skill business side stuff too, in the same way that you figure out random cryptic bugs in production, even though a minute ago it was running perfectly locally. So that's been sort of my attitude. And that's what I was hoping to convey to to everyone today using Merge Freeze as the you know example project. It's extremely interesting to me because I had that impression that we moved into the phase that the only way to earn money from software is either to be employed by somebody or to have that amazing idea, that project to get VC money that will finance you until you get to 
50 employees and the own a uh, couple of hundred million dollars and stuff. I was completely disconnected, to be honest, of that middle possibility, right? Kind of, if I understand right what you're saying, you do not need millions in VC money to earn some money and you don't need, the, the only alternative is not really to be fully employed by somebody, right? You can have your own gig, if I understand what you're saying, right? That's right. And I think the narrative on this, because I'm not the first person to say, do it on your own, bootstrap, you don't need funding. I'm not the first person to say any of that. But I think I have a different perspective on why that is true than most people. So most people will say, you don't need to raise money because you can build an audience and a newsletter and go on Twitter and get revenue before you build the product. And you can live off the revenue and not investor funds. And that's sort of the normal persuasion that you know we look at when we're trying to debate, should I quit my job or whatever. I think the better way to look at it, the more productive way is to realize that when you raise money, the fund investor giving you money is only doing that because the market you're trying to get into is huge, right? Like they want a 100x return. But what that means is the market you're trying to get into is incredibly competitive and everyone's trying to destroy you. So I hardly think it makes sense to claim that you need to raise money to make something successful because by virtue of raising money, you're actually putting yourself into a world of pain, right? So I think the better approach to what can you do without raising money is actually try to find things, try to find the niches that you can build where nobody would give you money. Like that's specifically what I'm looking for. Merge freeze is not a venture fundable project. No one would ever give us a million bucks because it's never going to be worth a billion bucks. And that's the bottom line. And so when you're pursuing ideas that are huge, then sure, you need to raise money and enjoy, right? Enjoy the fundraising process. Enjoy the heartache that comes with that. Enjoy all the legal documentation. But if you have small ideas, I think you skip a lot of steps. You never have to worry about someone competing with you with a million dollars more in their bank account than you have. Um, so that's what I really like about what we sort of classify as micro PE, PE, private equity. Generally, these are hundreds of millions of dollar deals, billion dollar deals. We do micro PE. So we're talking like buy an app that makes 10 grand a month, which is already an amazing living for an individual if you're able to run it, and then try to make it grow to 100K a month. And when you sell that, you can do whatever that you, you, wanna, you, know, that you want for the rest of your life. And that's no VC money, no VC backed competitors, no, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and work all night kind of attitude. It's simply pick an area where nobody else wants to compete with you. Now, when you say we, who is we? Yes. So not the royal we. Uh, I've been a partner at a small, we call it micro PE fund called Fork Equity. I think we started five years ago and we've done about 15, 20 different deals. That's a mix of buying apps, starting apps on our own selling apps that we built or bought. And earlier this year, or so far this year, we've bought Merge Freeze, we sold FOMO.com, we sold Lobaloo.com, which is a florist invoicing tool, so super, super niche. And actually today, we closed on another app called GetReviews.ai. It's a marketing tool. So we've been doing quite a few deals. Um, at any given time, we have about six apps in our portfolio at different sizes, you know, um, in terms of monthly revenue. But we focus on B2B subscription marketing type apps. Every app is different. You have to apply different treatment, different marketing tactics. There's going to be a different code base. But we try to make things as uniform as possible for developer happiness, for having a nice, relaxed working atmosphere But in terms of context switching between your apps. We make all of our apps in the same tech stack. We use all the same, you know, platforms as a service, infrastructure as a service tools. We use the same email marketing tools across all of our projects. And by doing that, we're able to, I think, you know, run different projects in parallel without feeling too stressed out. And we're able to keep the size of the company small and we're able to buy and sell them, you know, independently. So nothing is sort of interconnected. Everything has its own siloed architecture and things like that. When you say you're using the same tech stack, does that mean if somebody's wanting to get rid of their project, that it fit, has to fit into the tech stack you're already using? Or do you take whatever they have and convert it into the stack of your choice? We've been getting quite good at converting. <laughs> so actually the app we closed on today, Git Reviews, is in the Mern stack. And I don't like any of that. 
So we're rebuilding it in Rails. We're just going to do Rails 7. It's on Heroku, the, where they put it, which we're happy with. Heroku's easy, uh, a little bit pricier, right, than having your own droplet or AWS, but whatever. We don't care about that. But we're going to convert everything to Rails backend and either Vue or React frontend or whatever. So all of our apps are in Rails. And I think this is the third time where we bought an app that was either originally Node or originally Laravel or whatever. And then we just c- convert it, you know, full feature parity, pixel perfect, you know, and then the, the user has no, no idea what happened. So what we're going to do is at some point in the next 30 to 60 days, we're going to have, you know, a 2 a.m., get your coffee, zero downtime, you know, migration. And those are never fun. They can be a little stressful, but we've done probably four or five zero downtime migrations. We're quite good at it. And so that's also allowed us to expand that horizon of deal flow, right? If you say, hey, it has to be this stack and you reject everything else, well, it's already hard enough to find a a company that you're interested in. Now hoping that they have the same taste as you do, good luck, right? But if you can find someone, either yourself or even like a hired freelancer who will come in and they used to be a WordPress dev, so they're great at PHP, but now they do Node or whatever, and you can have them transfer it. Um, We found that to be an excellent middle ground. Uh, you will have to work that into your, you know, your finances and calculating when you're going to get your payback period and all of that. But if you can make the numbers work, we think it's uh, way better to just make everything in your preferred stack rather than try to become a renaissance man and do all the things. It's very interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong. If I understand it correctly, you're basically, in some cases at least, you're not buying that's something because of the code. You're not buying the code. You're rather buying uh, user base, uh, adoption, something like that, right? Yes. Thank you for... Yeah, that's exactly right. So this is what a lot of people, in my opinion, want to argue about. They want to argue like, well, I spent eight months writing the code and you know, I get paid this much at my job and and therefore, you know, it's already worth a base amount of, of this much. Forget the revenue, however much we have or don't have. And the way we think about it is like the inverse, what you just said. What we're buying is product market fit. That is what every developer, if you've ever launched a side project, and I think all of us have, that is the thing that is seemingly impossible. That is the mythical creature unicorn. Turns out building stuff to spec, making it look beautiful, design, even running marketing to some degree, you know, running the campaigns, executing the tactics, sending the emails, you know, targeting your ad campaigns, whatever. All of that is easy. All of that is easy. And there's already a market rate for that, right? It's it's 20 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, 100 bucks an hour, depending on the job, depending on the country, the person you're hiring lives in. That's the market rate. You can get any of those things done by clicking a few times on a freelance website. What nobody has a a turnkey way to achieve is product market fit. And so when we buy an app, it's kind of like you get the code for free. You get all of their months of experimentation and bug fixes and server crashes and rollbacks. You get all of that insight and knowledge, all of that scar tissue you get for free. Obviously you get the domain for free. You get whatever SEO juice they have for free. What you're paying for is the promise, right? You're paying for this truth that they have uncovered in the market, which is that some number of people want this kind of solution. As someone myself who built tons and tons, dozens of side project, you know, I launched them all. These are like, I'm talking like 30 or 40 projects with their own domain, with their own G Suite email account, with their own, you know, blog, not all of them a blog, but, you know, full blown I tried to turn them into businesses. I've launched at least 30 or 40. And other than my close friends, you know, a spike of traffic you get on Hacker News or Product Hunt or whatever, none of them turn into businesses. But then suddenly I start buying things that already work and it's like game changer. So you're getting the code for free. You're getting everything else for free. You're paying for this uh, really impossible to replicate element, which is the product market fit. How do you figure out what is a market fit? I'm... Imagining that if you would know, hey, this idea would be a market fit, then probably you wouldn't be buying it. You would just start building. So I'm guessing there is some kind of magic formula to say, hey, this thing has a potential that that person is not seeing in a way, right? So a couple things. First, 
to me, product market fit, if I had to just pick one thing, right? And then this is a raging debate, by the way, uh, especially among marketers. Is product market fit some number of users? Is it like based on what type of product? Like if you have a mobile app, does that mean you have to look at MAUs? But if you have a web app, do you just need to look at like revenue or number of customers? But what if you have an enterprise product and you literally have eight customers? Do you have less product market fit than someone with a free app at 10,000? I don't think so, right? It takes a long time to close an enterprise deal. So I think a lot of the numbers people try to use are not one size fits all. But if I had to pick one number to define product market fit, or at least to say this is an indicator, it would be churn. If people aren't canceling, if they continue to give you the scarce resource, their hard-earned cash, that's a really good signal. And then I think the other one is actually, and this is really hard to, I guess, quantize, but the other element of product market fit is that you have customers which beget more customers. So to your point, let's say I come across a project. All of us look at cool cool projects all day and you go, this is awesome. And they have a hundred customers and I could build that, <laughs> right? That, that's like the logic jump that all of us have had a thousand times. This is awesome and I could build it better and they have a hundred customers and I could do that. The challenge is, or the, the, I think the flaw with that logic is maybe they have a thousand customers because a month or two ago they had 900 and just the existence of 900 customers and the logos on their homepage or their testimonials or some buzzwords or referral or, you know, people mentioning them on Reddit, the existence of 900 customers is what got them that other 100. Now they have a thousand back when they had a hundred customers, the existence of the previous 80 is what got them that extra 20. And I think that can't be understated. And I think that's why we see a lot of me too competitors, clones of apps fail because part of the product market fit, part of the growth flywheel was simply having the social proof of existing customers. So when I look at apps and I say, hey, this tech's kind of easy, should we just build it ourselves? I've had to sort of slowly train myself to slap myself in the face, like that's not the point. <laughs> it doesn't matter how simple it is. What they figured out is how to get customers and that's what I can't do in my pajamas. I can code in my pajamas. I can run marketing in my pajamas. I can't figure out how to get hundreds or thousands or however many customers somebody already has. They figured it out. They might not even know how they did it, right? It's if it might feel like a fluke of nature to even the founder. So who am I to think that the the antidote to that is to just write the same type of code? It's it's not. Uh, and that's the element of product market fit that's really hard to quantify attribution in marketing, you know, there's no stack trace. There's just not, you know, you can look in your analytics tool of choice and sort of see someone came from this website. You get like one point of additional insight. Otherwise you just don't know. And so I think to me, the point of marketing is to do marketing until you don't need to do marketing. Like the point of marketing is to work yourself out of a job as a marketer, whereas product and everything else keeps begetting more product. You know, you build something, get a thousand users. Now you have more features and you have to scale up to 2000 users. But the point of marketing is to not do marketing anymore. And so when we buy an app, we're finding someone who's at that point. I want to go back to your build it ourselves thought earlier. You were talking specifically around code, but I also want to go back to even earlier to where you say you run on Heroku and you's like, we could build it on AWS. We could build out our infrastructure, but we don't care about that. As people that usually do DevOps, we're going to think, okay, now we need EKS or some other Kubernetes cluster. We got to do all these other things. But at the end of the day, here's my app, go run it. And there's a handful of places that allow you to do that easily, right? For a credit card swipe. Why would anybody want to build their own infrastructure anymore? Well, I, I can tell you, I mean, I think a lot of us agree with that at the basic intellectual level. Why would I build this? A great version exists, whatever. But then we just see our friends building everything from scratch over and over again all the time anyway. You know, <laughs> even in marketing where people don't code, but they still sort of build stuff. So in marketing or productivity Twitter, if you want to call it like in terms of circles of, of groups of shared interest, on marketing Twitter, on productivity Twitter, there's always a new note-taking tool coming out. There's always a new way to structure your notion. There's always a new way to you know try to squeeze more productivity uh, and it's this weird, like intellectual porn that people are just addicted to, like focusing on things that have already been figured out, hoping that maybe they'll, you know, they'll find some new, new edge. And sometimes people do. So I don't want to shun this entire idea, but developers, I think are the most guilty of doing this, the most guilty go on GitHub, 
uh, every developer has a, these are my dot files, <laughs> you know, repo. Every developer has like so many things that other developers have already done. I think there's just a lot of ego and sometimes it's fun as well. I don't want to say that doing something on your own means that you made a mistake. If you enjoy building something that already exists, great. But a lot of developers go way too far and they build all this junk that nobody cares about. Even they don't care about. It's just like they're trying to challenge themselves. It's like this masochistic thing. And so for us, you know, it's like, what is my focus? Well, I want to not have a boss. I want to not go to meetings. I want to have a bedroom separate from my office. Like that, that's the lifestyle I want. Okay, what do I need to do? I need to get this much money per month. How do I get this much money per month? Make something that people want. How do I make something people want? I don't know, but I can go find apps of people who did figure that out. Um, how do I buy the app? Well, I, I work for some boss for a while and you know save some of the money and then boom, you're off. Now you're doing your own thing. Nowhere in that equation of those logic jumps was Kubernetes or anything like that, right? So all of those should just come as a forcing function, you know, you buy an app, you get a billion users, and now you need to upgrade your systems. Now you need on-prem, whatever. Do all that as you get there. But otherwise, I think there's a lot of over-engineering because people are in their comfort zone. So you go work at a big company, you're working with Kubernetes, and that's what you do, and you're really good at it. Well, that weekend when you start a side project, what are you going to spin up? You know, you're going to do your Docker image, and you're going to do all these the same tooling that you use at your day job but none of that is necessary. Um, so I think there's, a, there's an element of maybe not beginner's luck, but like there's an element of being too smart for your own good, where I think having the hacker mindset, taking off your TDD hat, taking off your whatever, whatever you know, structure you have in place at your, your corporate role, uh, I think it's kind of necessary if you're going to jump into buying small apps because suddenly all of your priorities change. And people say this about like having kids, right? I don't have kids. Maybe you guys do. It's like, oh, once I had the kid, like all of my priorities changed. Like I had 80 to do's and suddenly I didn't care about 60 of them. And it's sort of like that on a maybe less dramatic scale. Once you start working with a small project that makes money and it provides a good service at a reasonable price and you don't have venture back competitors and you're not stressed out and you're making money, none of the like over-engineering stuff matters at all. And so that's why I'm very excited to now be sort of spiting the world, spitting into the wind maybe at myself, that I'm like managing a dev tool and I with, I've i never called myself an engineer, right? But I'm building all the features, I'm doing the customer support, I'm working on marketing. I think it's like a troll, it's fun, I'm enjoying it and hopefully it will encourage real developers to, to try to do the same thing. If somebody wanted to try to find an app I'll say like Mertrees, not like Mertrees, but you know, how do people go about finding these apps that people are trying to dump? Well, there's two places to find deals. One is when people are trying to sell and when they're trying to sell, it's easy to find them. You go on MicroQuire, you go on Flippa, you know, there's a lot of brokerages and marketplaces and that's great. But then the problem you run into is they have a bunch of leads, right? So you're just one of many people who's going to be pounding their door down, asking them questions, negotiating. You might get in a bidding war, you might overspend, but that is one main main way to find these apps is they'll actually come to you. So just find some brokerages, put your email in there, set up some filters, and you'll get daily deal flow. The other way is to go find the deals and buy companies that don't know they're for sale. And to do that, you have to have the mindset that everything has a price and everything is for sale all the time. So that takes a little bit more of a a little bit more faith. It definitely takes more time. And when you try to buy companies that aren't for sale, you're going to get a lot lower response rate. You're going to get a lot less success with negotiating. You're going to get less trust in terms of saying, hey, what's your revenue or whatever. They're just going to, why, why would I give you that? Right. But that's actually where you get the best deals. But I think with people getting started, I generally suggest just go on the brokerages, look at hundreds of listings, look at hundreds of deals. It's going to start to refine your taste and, and it's, you're going to reveal to yourself, what things do I like? What types of companies are interesting to me? And you're going to do that by process of elimination, by looking at tons of stuff where you say, ooh, gross, that's not interesting to me. I hate that idea. And then you're going to look for the patterns because humans are pattern matching machines and go, oh, I guess I don't want an app that has to do demo calls. So, okay, I don't want a high touch sales app. I don't want an app with a JavaScript widget because there's so many browser compatibility issues. I do or I don't want an app 
that you know has a mobile component because I don't want to write in Swift or whatever. And so I would suggest that as the first start. We started doing this on a course even. Like we made this thing, microacquisitions.com, where we've had over a thousand students come in and tr we've tried to you know convey our ideas, how to find an app to buy, how to negotiate. Here's some legal template docs. Once you own it, what do you do next, right? Making that 90 day, you know, you could call it go to market marketing plan, how to build systems so that you can manage it simultaneously to a full-time job or having another job. And then eventually, I think our last section is how to sell your app, you know, how to get a bidding war going, how to do due diligence and all that good stuff. But yeah, to get started, you know, for free, you just need to look at companies for sale and take notes on what you do or don't like about them. And that becomes your investment thesis. And then everything else leads from there. So that's basically like doing a dry run of day trading to where you're just trying to figure out what, what the fit is for you. Cause you're able to track those features of those companies that are, that are trying to sell themselves. I, I, I want to go down the other path though. Let's just, let's assume you've done your homework and you found all those check marks and I want to go down that Company's not for sale. How do you build that relationship with somebody? Again, you said it's a long-term play, but how long-term is it really? Well, depending on the size of the project, it can be it can take strategy to even literally be noticed by the owner, right? So, like if you find something that has a hundred thousand users, let's say, and they're all active, you might not have any luck if you email first name at app.com. That founder may just have too many emails. They may just be too busy. In that case, you know, you probably want to use the app, become a paying customer. Maybe there's like a separate support line for paying customers. Maybe once you become a customer or user, you get subscribed to the newsletter. Maybe the newsletter is then sent from the founder's address. And if you reply to the newsletter, they will be more nice to you. So this is all a big hint. <laughs> it's actually something we've done is you subscribe to an app's newsletter that you want to buy, wait for them to send the next email newsletter out and then reply to it. Right, they're ten times more likely to reply to someone who engaged with their content than a cold email. But it is a cold email, right? It's just a cold email that you put in as a reply to their email. So that's a strategy. But first, you have to connect. Will they even, you know, will they even speak to you at all? And then you have to build trust. For us, I think what's cool about building trust is that it gets easier over time. You know, so like we have a website, ForkEquity.com, that says we buy companies and it has links and social proof. If you're like one person in a room, you might want to have a blog post or at least like a nice photo on your GitHub profile. And you can have like the GitHub readme file that kind of says like a self introduction, you know, three sentences, four sentences on GitHub pages. Um, but you have to be able to build a little bit of trust. And once you do that, you know, the world is your oyster. We've had people who give us all their revenue information within two short emails, right? We've ne they've never heard of me. I've never heard of them. And two quick emails back and forth in a day based on just our tone. Maybe we find a way that we are related. You know, like I look at their LinkedIn and I see that they live in some city and I've been there, right? And I'll mention that in my email to them. Oh, I had a great time at this restaurant. Have you ever been? By the way, um, can you share some of your revenue? I'm, I'm a very serious buyer, right? Those kinds of things, you build trust very quickly and then you can get to that truth, which is they do want to sell. They're, they're not interested in selling. You can figure out if, if, if there's a price that's reasonable for both of you. But I would say essentially to break it all down, practical terms, it's email. You know, you're going to find these companies with websites, listings, marketplaces, alerts, whatever. And then you're going to go from zero to running a company through email, especially if you're dealing with developer founders, you know, good luck saying, Hey, can we hop on a call? I haven't asked someone for a call in at least four or five years, not a single person. I haven't even asked like a friend, hey, can we have a call? Maybe I'm a bad friend, but I just don't do that. I don't respond well to that when people ask me for a call. So you're gonna find them online, indie hackers, wherever, and then you're gonna do email and that's gonna get your deal done and potentially you know, really change your, change your career. What's interesting in that is you're saying, be a human instead of a lead. Mm. Why is that so hard for people to grok? <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, well, that's a great it's, question. It's not rocket science here. Nothing you've said is rocket science. Right. Maybe it's the short tail, long tail sort of thinking. So, like for us, if I 
talk to three small project companies a week. And I just assume that like almost all three of them are always going to be not interested. But that three per week really compounds. At the end of a year, I've talked to 150 founders and given 150 people a compliment about their small business. And I've even maybe expressed that I was interested in buying it, which is a great ego boost, you know, really another compliment. Well, over the year or two, now I have 100, 200, 300 founders who kind of might remember sort of my name or my avatar if it popped up. Um, they sort of remember that there was this one guy named Ryan who, who emailed them about buying their company. That is going to create sort of incalculable number of other, other opportunities. So the next thing you know, they never want to sell their company. I want to buy Acmeco. Acmeco never wants to sell. But I had a very pleasant, nice exchange with with John behind Acmeco over two emails. And nine months later, his friend wants to sell their company. And her company, she doesn't know where to sell. And she asked John, and John refers her to me. And boom. Now my failed attempt to buy company A led to me buying company B, off-market, no bidding war, casual warm introduction, easy due diligence because there's trust. And, and I think that's just, like you said, it's not rocket science. It's just having a, a bias for long-term gratification. And in the sales, people, when they're in sales mode, it's all about short-term gratification because you got to hit your quota this week, this month, this quarter, all of those are short-term words. But when you decide, hey, I buy small companies, I grow them and I sell them, suddenly now you're looking at at least a three to five year horizon that's that's long term and it's really long term compared to the way most people think about work and i think by doing that you can stand out you have a better success rate and like you said no matter what happens at the end of the day you came off as pleasant and human and you didn't ruffle any feathers and you probably got company b at a much lower multiple than you would have otherwise yes you didn't say it that directly but <laughs> well <laughs> yeah and to true, fill in, it was off market right to fill in what i mentioned earlier i mentioned sort of opaquely that we bought this tool merge freeze because some guy emailed me. But to fill in the details there, that guy who emailed me the lead, he enrolled in our course, Micro Acquisitions, like two years ago. <laughs> so this is a guy that I didn't know who he was. He enrolled in our, you know, it's a self-service course. It's not like a live training. He enrolled in the course, I guess, took the course. Two years later, he's doing his own deal flow. He finds this cool developer tool. Then he thinks maybe Ryan, the guy who made this course I took one time would be interested. Like that's an incredibly long tail referral. And then, you know, we bought Merge Freeze. It was not on market, right? If he had listed it online, I'm sure he would have, he might have gotten a higher amount of money. You know, it definitely would have been harder to buy it. I would have had to be more convincing. I would have had to do a bid of, you know, submit multiple bids. It just would have been more painful. But I got a referral and I got the referral because I made a piece of content and, it, and that happened two years ago. So is the microacquisitions.com course still live? Oh yeah. We've been uh we've been making improvements to it. You know, I think we've got we've probably added 30 lectures over the last couple of years, like extra lectures. It's probably got 80 now. We probably have to stop. <laughs> we try to just give people everything they need. We give them legal docs. We have a private student community. We even built our own deal flow tool. It's called deal flow. <laughs> and uh that allows people to plug in filters and alerts and you know, get emails every couple of days with companies that might fit their their preferences. And then, uh, you know, we send newsletters every month or two with with opportunities, like someone looking for financing, we'll figure out how to get a, a pro at SBA loads to do a guest lecture, and we'll share that out. Or somebody who's trying to sell their app, we'll share that just with our students. So they get that sort of off-market deal flow as a, as a small perk of being, a, you know, in the community. So that's been really rewarding for us because now we're actually improving our own deal flow. It's like if every student it becomes sort of like a scout for our fund, now we have a thousand people out there who whenever they come across a deal, if it's not a fit for them, they might think to themselves, maybe this would be a good fit for Ryan. Maybe this would be a good fit for Fork Equity. And so it's just this sort of flywheel that we didn't intend it to be that way. It looks smart now in retrospect. We originally created it because we just wanted to help people. But now it's actually become, a you know I think, a really important part of how we find companies to buy and how we stay up to date with, you know, what could, you know, consumers want to buy. How much money one needs to have to kind of enter into that type of, I'm not sure whether business is the right word, but are we talking about five figures, six figures, seven figures? The boring answer is it depends. 
But the financing is this area where for better or worse, you can actually be very creative, right? <laughs> I say for worse because we watch governments who are, who are very, very creative. And in financing, you don't always have to have cash up front. You can pay over time. Who do you pay over time to? It could be a loan. It could be seller side financing where you actually pay the, the original founder out of revenue, or you could pay all up front and get a discount. You can pay half and pay them half in a year or two later. So there's a lot of different structures. I would say, or I definitely can say um, definitively, you can get started with zero dollars. But what I would say is the less money you put in up front, the more elbow grease you're going to put in up front, right? The more money you put in up front, the higher leverage you can be. So our first deal we did was FOMO, or it's, it's called FOMO now. We sold it a few months ago. It was a Shopify app. We paid zero up front. We had zero. <laughs> I think I paid, I just said this on Twitter a couple of days ago. I think my partner and I paid $1,200 to make, you know, an LLC, uh, to make a business entity. And, uh, but we got this app that was already making money every month. It was making thousands of dollars a month in revenue. And we essentially paid 100% of the revenue of the app directly to the founder for like 20 months in a row. And we had to write in our contract that if we missed one payment, he would get the whole app back. <laughs> So luckily we didn't ever miss a payment. He got paid out over 20 months and 20 months later, we owned a, a really significant app that we kept working on for five, six years. And then we sold it, you know, a, a few months ago. And, and that really changed my life when we sold that app. And so I started all of this with zero, but most recently, you know, we've been buying apps, paying five figures, paying six figures that are actually similar size as the app that we, you know, paid zero upfront for. So it's hard to even say that the bigger the app is, the more money you need. It really comes down to the structure of your financing and what the seller is willing to do. Sometimes sellers just need to get out for personal reasons. They had something, a family thing, and they need to focus on that so they have no time and they will be more open to creative arrangements. Sometimes those sellers are in very intentionally selling their app. They are trying to orchestrate a bidding war and they're putting it on a listing on a marketplace and working with brokers. In those cases, you got to be prepared to have more cash in hand. But when you can find those deals that are off market, where it's sort of this serendipitous timing, where you know they just had a kid and they'd like to have dedicate more time to that, or they're just getting burned out from whatever it is that they're building, those are the types of deals that are really special because you can be more creative with financing. You can work with a much lower budget. You don't have to put as much risk in upfront in terms of capital. You're going to get a better price from them. And hopefully you're going to create a really nice win for all, all parties because you're going to sort of be this white knight to them and they are going to be the portal for you to go into being an entrepreneur and getting to skip all of those steps that all of us face, which is figuring out how to build something people actually want. They've already done it. Did you ever make a mistake? Were you in a situation that, I don't know, a year later, two years later, you say, why the heck did I get this one? So far, I'm... I would knock on wood. I don't want to blast your ears. Um, yeah, we've actually had an amazing track record so far. We've been very lucky. Uh, everything we've bought, we've sold for several times more than we paid for it. And we've made it cash flow while we own it. I think that just comes down to being really, really picky upfront. So you're gonna have to be picky somewhere. You could be picky on the front end and just buy fewer apps and be patient and maybe only do one or two deals a year. Or you could be picky on the back end where you buy everything that looks kind of interesting and then you're paying for it every day because you're stressed out and you hate you know, your portfolio. So we've tried to do the former strategy. Everything we've bought, it wasn't always like the best fit for us, but it was at least close enough to our zone of competence that we never were totally overwhelmed. And part of that is like what we talked about earlier. We would always change the tech stack to Rails, right? We would always use the same email marketing tools and strategies. We've never bought an app where we had to do sales demos or hire a salesperson. By keeping some of the, the elements of these projects in the same zone, that helped us mitigate risk and it helped us stretch ourselves, but not ever feel like we're drowning or, or totally overwhelmed. So yeah, I think we've done 15 deals. Every single one of them has been positive ROI. We have a couple apps that haven't grown as much as we would like, but everything has grown and, and it's kind of just like time and pressure. You know, it's like the, the end of... Uh, Shawshank Redemption or in Shawshank Redemption, they're talking about geology, Andy, it's just the study of time and pressure. And I think that working on small projects and growing them is really the same. One more question. 
Do you think you might? I'm guessing you didn't have so far, but do you think you might get uh, get a project uh, application that you will not want to sell? That kind of that would be a business that you just want to kind of keep as as your business in a way, right? Or it's always with the goal to sell. Originally, I thought the only way to win in this game was like house flipping, you know, like you have to buy it and you have to be able to put in minimum investment and increase the value and you have to be able to sell it pretty quickly for your IRR, you know, your rate of return to be high and impressive and appealing to other investors. That's really sort of how I thought about it for a while. But in the last year or two, as we've seen some of our projects not really take off, just kind of grow very slow and steady. But as we've been able to sort of automate them, uh, you know, one or two customer support tickets per month, no issues with servers, no feature requests that we have to build. Now I'm starting to see this other option where if you have a project that is like what we call hold forever and it has cash flow, you know, what's the point of exiting? Like you're actually exiting every day. Every single day it makes some money. You know, the Stripe money goes into your bank and you didn't have to spend it all on servers. That's a huge win. You have exited every single day. Actually exiting forever and making it someone else's problem is now totally optional. And so I would say right now in our maybe five or six projects across those, probably two of them are sort of like hold forever, even maybe including merge freeze. I couldn't care less if we ever sell merge freeze. We paid cash up front. We don't have any investors on it. It's just us, myself and my partner. It's easy to maintain. It's fun. We've made the app, I think we grew like 3.5x, 350% in the last few months. It looks nice. We added a bunch of features people wanted. The limited customer support we get is like one email a week of a big bank or something that says, hey, can you answer our security questionnaire? I, I probably spend most of my time doing security questionnaires, right? Not coding or dealing with any types of bugs. So merge freeze, it's like, yeah, we could just hold it forever. If someone approached us and we became that off-market deal where it was like a really nice person, seemed like they could keep hacking on it and gave us an offer we couldn't refuse, sure. But uh, that's also a really cool yeah, avenue for buying these companies. You, you don't have to sell. You don't ever have to go on a roadshow and do any of that stuff you're not comfortable with. Just make it useful, automate it, minimize the cost, minimize the time you spend on it and provide the service. And it's it's really kind of an amazing way to even keep building your own reputation, I think, as well. You know, there's that guy, Alan Shreve. Isn't that the guy who built Ingrok? And there's some of these dev tools that to me are like no brainer on everybody's tool belt. Like to me, everybody has some kind of tunneling service. Everybody has a CI. So how neat would it be for your career, if, you, if you're someone who wants to have a, a traditional career, to sort of be the one who operates this tidy, nifty, useful application you're not trying to be a startup. You're not trying to make a billion dollars. You're not trying to ever raise investor money. You're not doing a bunch of fancy marketing. You're just the guy who maintains this project that's useful that hundreds or maybe thousands of people know about. I think it's a really cool way to, um, I would say, bifurcate our time, You know, have our work and have our play, where even your play makes money and it's, and it's relaxed and, and fun. So all of Ryan's contact information is going to be down in the show notes. But Ryan, if people wanted to reach out to you, what is the best way to do that? Probably Twitter, and we can DM or, or email from there. It's Ryan C-K-U-L-P. Ryan, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcast, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.